Okay, so we talked about naming some of the more simple ionic compounds. Um, things will get a little more complicated um, when we move into the middle of the periodic table here. So the middle here are called transition metals. Um, some of the ones over here that are kind of underneath the nonmetals are sometimes called main group metals. Um, but the reality is outside of the first two columns and aluminum, most of the rest of the metals in the periodic table will have more than one possible charge um, that is stable, that they're likely to have in an ionic compound that we might be looking at. That is going to affect how we name those compounds, and it's also going to affect how we go about thinking about what the formula for those compounds is. Now, there's a couple I'll point out that generally just have one charge, right, which is something maybe worth trying to memorize because it can be a little confusing if you think you have to write a charge when you really don't because silver, for instance, is always plus one when it's in an ionic compound. So I want to give a couple examples. So I added a couple examples that we'll work on to the notes before I started recording. Um, but I want to give an example just real quick of, of kind of why things are a little different for transition metals. So I'm going to start with iron, which has the chemical symbol Fe. And iron is kind of right in the middle. So iron really can't gain enough electrons to be like Krypton. It can't lose enough electrons to be like argon. And the same is true for most of the metals in here. Um, they really can't get all the way. Now, some of the ones over on, all the way on like scandium only needs to lose three electrons. It can get to the same configuration as argon. But for a lot of these, there are a couple of intermediate spaces where they're stable, even though they can't get all the way to one side or the other. So for iron, there happen to be two. The two most common charges for iron are iron with a plus two charge and iron with a plus three charge. Now, this, however, means that when iron combines with a non-metal like oxygen, there's more than one possible formula. So if you take iron two and combine it with oxide, which we said has a minus two charge, you get a formula of just one of each, FeO, that gets you to zero net charge. But iron plus three, when it combines with oxygen, and we're not going to get a zero net charge until we reach the least common multiple of three and two, which is six. So that would be two irons, three oxygens. Now, what we talked about with the more straightforward ionic compounds was we just named the metal cation, and then we named the anion or nonmetal. In this case, we would call both of these iron oxide if that was the case, and that doesn't allow us to distinguish these two compounds. So what we do is we incorporate the charge that resides on the iron or on the metal. So FeO is called iron two oxide, and we write the two as a Roman numeral inside a set of parentheses. So iron two oxide versus Fe2O3. In that case, the iron had a charge of plus three. That is iron three oxide. So with any transition metals, right, so metals outside of the first two columns, aluminum, we need to specify a charge. Right? And again, there are a couple exceptions I'll talk about um, a little bit when I have a little more um, opportunity toward the end of this section. Um, we have to specify the charge in the name. So there's got to be a Roman numeral in there indicating the charge. Now, if we've got a formula and we're trying to figure out what the proper name is, We'll have to identify from the formula what the charge is so we know what to put in the name that we're using to describe that compound. So I want to do a couple examples of these going both ways and kind of show this. But again, you've really got to practice this to really get it. Um, and before I get into that, let me say one more thing. There is an older way of naming the different forms of iron, for example based on Latin names that is kind of fallen out of fashion. You may see a little blurb about it if you're, if you're looking online resources. There's a little blurb in the text. Um, in the older system, um, FeO is ferrous oxide and Fe2O3 is ferric oxide. So you use IC at the end for the higher charged of the two most common charges. OUS at the end for the lower charge of the two most common charges. But that gets all kinds of complicated because now you've got to memorize the two most stable charges 
for each element so that you know which one is which. And there are actually charges that fall outside of there that maybe aren't as common. So that has really kind of fallen away and we just use the numbering system now. Okay, going to the examples that I laid out here. Um, the first two here, we've got the formula and this would mean we're trying to figure out what the name of this compound should be. Ti is titanium, right? That is a transition metal. It is right, right here. Um, that means we've got to figure out what charge it should carry in this compound. To do that, we've got to look at the anion it is bonded with. So S, we know, is sulfur. And where sulfur exists in the periodic table, it tends to have a charge of minus 2. That's going to be its most stable ionic formula. So if there's two sulfur anions, and each has a charge of minus 2, that's a total of minus 4 from the sulfurs. We know that's got to be balanced by the charge of the metal. So in this case, we have a total of minus 4 from the sulfurs. That means we must have a total of plus 4 from the titanium. So the charge on the titanium has to be 4. So that makes the name of this compound titanium 4 sulfide. Right? But it's a good thing all anions have a consistent charge. So we can always use the anion to figure out the charge on the cation. You've just got to do a little math in your head. But if you know your multiplication tables up to maybe 7, you'd know how to do all of this math. So it is not complicated math. It's plus 4 plus minus 4 equals 0 sort of stuff. Okay, the second one. Uh, PT is platinum. Platinum is a transition metal as well. It's a little more toward the middle of the transition metals. Um, but that means we've got to figure out what the charge of platinum is based on the rest of the formula. Um, Cl is chlorine, right? So it's chloride here in the anionic form. If you find chlorine on your periodic table, it is in the 17th column. It is a column that tends to have a charge of minus one. So if each chloride anion has a charge of minus one and there's four of them, that's again a charge of minus four, similar to the previous example. That means the platinum here must have a charge of plus four. So this compound is platinum four chloride. Okay. Now, for transition metals, going from name to formula is maybe a little easier because the charge has to already be provided. Right? And in this case, we're told we have copper with a charge of plus one. So I'm going to use an intermediate step here of writing out the charges just to help with the math that we're going to need to do to figure out the formula. Oxide, that's oxygen. It will have a charge of minus two. Right? Now remember, the positives and the negatives have to have equal magnitude so that there'd be a net zero charge on the resulting formula. That would mean we need two coppers to get to plus two to balance the minus two of oxygen. So copper one oxide is two coppers and one oxygen, or Cu2O. And gold three sulfide, that's a gold with a charge of plus three. Sulfide is sulfur's anion. That would have a charge of minus two, again, based on where it is in the periodic table. Right? Plus three minus two, that means the least common multiple of six. So to balance those charges, we'd need two golds and three sulfurs. Right? And yeah, there's, there's lots and lots of combinations in there, right? but we have already seen almost all of the variability in terms of charges. Right? Almost all of the compounds fall into the category of one, two, or three. Plus one, plus two, plus three, minus one, minus two, minus three. There's some occasionally a plus four, a plus five, right? but that shouldn't complicate things a whole lot. We've actually seen almost every example so far. Okay, now there's one more thing that we have to talk about in terms of naming ionic compounds, and that is the introduction of polyatomic ions. We will put that in the next video.